So, hi guys, welcome to seminar number 10. Um, I'm AJ Williams. Um, before I start, I just would like to acknowledge the traditional owners, traditional owners of the land that I'm currently on. I'm here in Baldwin Q on the land of the Rundry people. I pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that to the lands that you're currently calling in from as well. If it's not Wurundjeri land, wherever you are, I acknowledge your elders past and present and emerging. But also like to extend that to lands where you may have grown up on, which may be somewhere completely different. And I want to pay respect to your elders too, that helped shape who you became today. So today's workshop is um, about embedding Aboriginal uh, perspectives into our curriculum. Um, we've got two great speakers tonight. We've got Taylor Hampton, who will just give us a wave for a second. And we've got Shay Rottemer, who just give us a wave, Shay, so it can come up on the screen. Yep, cool. Um, who are going to share with us. They're both um, consultants that actually work uh, with um, early childhood uh, uh, services. Um, and they're also going to provide some tips uh, to start the process of embedding uh, perspectives into curriculum. So I'm first gonna just get uh, Taylor to introduce himself. So I'll throw over to Taylor. Uh, g'day guys. Um, yes, yeah, so as I just said, um, my name's Taylor. And before I do further, I just also wanna acknowledge the traditional customers and lands on which we're all connected today. Um, I'm on the lands of Zura people. So I just wanna pay my respects to those people and um, and the elders uh, past, present and emerging. Um, so um, yeah, as my name's Taylor Hampton, I'm proud of the Empire Rajri men. Um, from originally from West Wylong, um, central New South Wales. Um, uh, currently living in, in Baron Duda, as I said, as I'm Duda a country. Um, I run a business called Brain Culture Connections with my uh, fiance, where we yeah, go into preschools, schools um, in and around uh, my area, um, and then recently a little bit further into New South Wales and a little bit into, into Vic as well, um, where we go into preschools and, and, and uh, deliver cultural workshops to the kids, very simplified, generalised information, um, activity, singing, painting, dancing, um, throwing boomerangs as well, returning boomerangs that I make um, and um, do a lot of fun with it. Um, kids absolutely have a blast. The teachers, um, the educators um, really enjoy it. Um, and one of the main things and the main piece of feedback that I get from the educators is um, they enjoy it because there's someone specific to actually deliver that stuff because they are... Um, as much as they want to deliver that, that, that work, um, they don't want to be disrespectful or they don't want to um, uh, seem, make it seem tokenistic or come across as insensitive. So to have someone um, that's able to deliver the work that they are uh, really passionate about, um, they, they grab it by the hands and then they really take it on board and, um, and listen as much as the kids listen. Um, it's really, really good. Um, I think that's really, really about me um at the start do you, that's it yep and then we'll yeah talk about it a little bit further on yep cool yep. i'm gonna throw over to shay yeah good day everybody my name's shay rodama i'm a guni jamara iwaja man uh from southwest victoria and from uh croker island up in the northern territory in uh, arnhem land uh I do a fair bit of work in schools um primary schools kindergartens, that sort of thing, most recently have developed some resources with language for uh, the Deward Wurrung Elderly Community Health Service in Portland there. Um, uh, I run my own company, it's called uh, Gunajaki and Alaminga and Cultural Enterprises, so we do a bit of everything, um, but mainly around uh, kids, country and culture, that, that's my mantra. So having seven children of my own, I've got a fair bit of experience in um, trying to embed perspectives in, in their lives and... Um, taking into account people who are off country, people who have been stolen um, and the generations that have followed that. So a bit of trauma there we've all got to clean up. I'll try to fix up together. Thanks for that. Cool. Thanks, guys. I'm going to go back to Taylor. Taylor, can you just give us a little understanding of what made you go into uh, the work that you actually do right now? Yes. Um, so as a kid um, growing up, I... I I didn't know much about my culture. The only thing I knew for me was that I was Aboriginal. Uh, my dad lost a lot of his identity, a lot of, a lot of his sense of self, um, not being allowed to speak his language, not being allowed to practice his culture. Um, and, and he lost all of that. Um, 
so he wasn't able to teach me and my brothers. You know, I've got six brothers and, and there, there wasn't a lot of a cultural education in my home. Um, you know, we went fishing, camping, spent time with cousins, but there wasn't a lot of cultural um, education behind that. And going to the schools as a kid growing up, um, we had, um, you know, the, the, the teachers in the schools um, seeing us as Aboriginal kids as a statistic as a as a ticker box of funding opportunity during those specific events um and there wasn't a lot of education prior to that or even after that um so we still never got a lot as a kid so when i moved away from west wylong um i did that on the purpose of wanting to find myself personally professionally and, and, and most importantly culturally and and i did that moved to albury and um and was able to introduced myself to the community. I had, luckily I had cousins and I had family in Albury. So it was quite easy for me to be um, recognized as a, um, someone who is Aboriginal in the community. And, um, and so I was able to um, meet elders, meet community members. I was working in um, other Aboriginal organizations. And when I started this business with my fiance, the, the whole idea around it was that I never got something like this as a kid. So I saw that an absolute, as an absolute need, especially in the area that I'm in, um, the gap that needed to be filled. Um, and I wanted to give back something to the kids that I never got, and that was cultural knowledge and education. And I'm not saying I'm an expert. I'm definitely not an expert. But what I know and what I've, what's been passed down to me, I want to share with the kids so that they can then do something that I never did was to create their own pathway or start their own journey and in that cultural, um, their, their cultural journey. And, and I hope that I'm doing that at the moment. And um, it's something that I, I find that's, that's very passionate within me and, and especially sharing culture, the ones that are, you know, that are willing to listen and not seeing it as a, as a tokenistic kind of thing. And um, I'm, I'm getting regular, um, I'm visiting regular preschools and child kids because they're wanting back so much because they, the kids love it and the kids are asking me about it. You know, just I'll give you an example. We had a, um, when I first started this, these workshops, um, it was on a, it was one time it was on a Thursday and, and one of the kids said, it's not Thursday anymore, it's Taylor Day because they absolutely love it. And that's, that's the, the moment they say it's Thursday, they say Taylor's coming in. I'm only in there for an hour, hour and a half. But that hour and hour and a half is specifically for them to learn culture, even if they're Aboriginal or not. Like it's there for that time for me to actually spend that time with them teaching very simplified, like I said, simplified, generalised information. I like to call them my little breadcrumbs. Give them that, those little breadcrumbs so they can then start to follow their own path. And um, that's something that I find that's, um, that that's really resonates well with me uh, because I never got that, so I want to give that back to kids. So... Um, yeah, it's 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 funny, you know. Um, and I'm I'm even um, just about to publish a children's book. Um, I don't know if you, I don't think I've even told you this, AJ, but um, the part of that these workshops actually the 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 um, the inspiration behind the book was because of that. You know, we have kids that are fair skinned like myself um, who are Aboriginal, and and some don't feel proud or or, or feel like they can acknowledge their Aboriginality because a lot of the children's books these days still show as Aboriginal people as, as dark skinned and um, as great but those books are unreal. Um, historically, they are really good um, to show how Aboriginal people lived and, and how they hunted and, and how they gathered and how they spent time together as one. Um, but there are a lot of Aboriginal kids that are fair skinned, um, but they don't feel like they can identify because they don't look like the books. And so whenever I went into a preschool, the first time I went to a preschool, one of the kids said, I've never met an Aboriginal person before. And I said, yes, you have. You're, you're meeting me. I'm Aboriginal. I'm very proud to be Aboriginal. I talked about why I'm proud. I spoke about all the stuff that I do as an Aboriginal person. Um, and then a week later, the kid came back and said that, you know, they can feel proud or they can say that they are Aboriginal because I look just like Taylor. And so the inspiration to the book started from there. And so we've been able to... Um, get a, a really deadly artist, um, Chantelle Walsh, who's, start, who's got a business, um, Cardi Creations, um, who's just designed the Rugby Women's World Cup Guernsey. Um, she's illustrated our book. And that book's idea was to show kids from all different mobs. Um, and we've got permissions and we've got acknowledgements from those, um, from those specific mobs that are in this book. But 
all the different kids have all different skin colors showing what the kids do in today's society um, practice and culture and i'm very excited it's nearly ready to be published so um you know that can be a, a great resource and i'm not just saying that because it's my book but um a great resource for for you know early childhood centers to especially for the very young kids who um want to learn what it means to be an aboriginal person in today's society um as, as a light-skinned aboriginal person dark-skinned aboriginal people as well um but it's just a way to, for everyone to feel proud of, of the skin they're in um, and to say that, you know, it's, it's the, the skin colour doesn't define who you are as an Aboriginal person. It's who, who you are inside and, and your family connection and um, how you practice that um, in there. So that all that together is, is why I'm doing what I'm doing um, because it's, the, it's just being able to share everything that's been passed down to me so I can pass that down to kids um, so they can start their, their own journey. Um, the title of the book is called Our Mold as well. Not ready yet, but it's it's almost there. Yeah. I'll come back to you, Taylor, and ask more a bit about what you what what activities that you do. Yep. I'm going to go over to Shay. What what took you into uh, doing cultural immersion, cultural awareness? Uh, pretty much similar to Taylor. Um, growing up in Ballarat, off country, from eight to eighteen, I remember when I was about nineteen and moved home. I, I asked myself what made me Aboriginal. Apart from a little bit of colour in my skin and a bit of the blood in my veins, so on in this journey from then to now, uh, 45. So started a dance group a couple of years later to build that identity. Um, we'd been falsely given a, a totem that wasn't ours, um, had all these beliefs that were actually incorrect, so I helped turn that around. So we had nine kids, I think we started, uh, what was it, 97, nine kids. Um, we've had almost 100 go through now, and now we have that second layer. Our, our children are dancing with us, and... Um, in, in regards to the, the light skin thing there, um, my my third, fourth son is um, blonde hair, blue eyes and fair as. Uh, I remember living in Darwin and getting walking around looking for him. He was up the front counter and they said, um, we're looking for this guy's, um, this, this fellow's father. And they, I went up to pick him up and they said, um, mate, don't, this can't be your son. I said, yes, it is. So he he started noticing it around four years old that you are dark, Majindi's dark, Poppy's dark and I'm not. So you've got to lift that up. I made it, made it special for him, and I started calling him the Golden Gundage. Uh, so that stuck with him to this day. Everywhere he goes, he gets the Golden Gundage. Uh, so that's pretty good. But um, a couple of things I've been doing recently um, uh, at the DWEC, doing the uh, the playgroup stuff, so trying to embed some culture into that. Um, the first thing I'm trying to do is make people realise that it's not a comp- you can't take components of culture and stick it in somewhere. Um, a lot of the DHS kids I work with as a mentor, they always want to learn about culture, but it's a, it's a holistic thing. Um, and with that that understanding, that um, place that we hold ourselves in the landscape as being no more than a grain of sand or one bat or a leaf on a tree, that we're all we're all even. Uh, we're not the masters of the environment. Um, the, the word the word Gundich means belonging to. So I'm a Kerab Gundich. I'm from Lake Conda. So that lake owns me. We don't own it. We belong to it. So once we get that sort of straight, then uh, we sort of go from there, set that fundamental basis. But um, I found out, figured out later and um, later that uh, when I was going into the other schools and working with non-Indigenous kids that had been growing up in, in the same area their entire lives, um, that they're part of this landscape now too, as much as the foxes or the, the rabbits, the, the windmills that we've got down here, the blue gum plantations, they're all part of this country now. So they've all got to, we've got to find that balance again. So the kids know their identity. Um, I didn't start speaking language until I was 19. Uh, I'm a senior songman now, or, you know, as, as, as it's turned out. Um, my children all I sung them lullabies when they're in their mum's bellies. So by the time they could talk, they could talk language. That's a win as far as I'm concerned. Um, but we've still got a long way to go. Um, living on the Tiwi Islands for a couple of years and seeing their bilingual education up there, the retention rates were awesome when they were learning in their own language and then back to English because once you learn English first, it's hard to learn anything else. Uh, and for some reason, the NT government decided to scrap that and retention went out the window. They um, couldn't keep the kids in classes. And uh, The other thing I've noticed is the kids that are off country. Um, it's hard for a parent to teach their children their culture on someone else's land. So I just curated an exhibition down here that celebrated the diversity and showcased all the different mobs that we have living down here on country. Uh, and for a lot of them, for the first time in, you know, some of them have been there their entire lives, have never been able to express 
who they are. So we had some mob from Indiraba, from um, Stradbroke Island, who actually did their art on the back of a possum skin rug as an amalgamation of their culture on, on, on our sort of medium. It was, uh, it was pretty powerful and well-received. Cool. Thanks. I'll go, flop back over to Taylor for a minute. And um, Taylor, what's, um, when you go into early childhood uh, services or when they contact you, what is it that they're actually asking for or do they know what they're asking for? And uh, what do you offer? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, so, so the way that we do it at the moment um, for for the new preschools and childcare centres, we we just chuck, like we've got a Facebook page. So we we chuck our Facebook page up and our posts up, and um, you know if they would like us to come in, um, then flick us a message, like a message on Facebook, and send us your email address, and then we send through our information pack. So it's exactly what we offer, you know, you know, boomerang throwing, um, uh, clapstick painting, boomerang painting, um, and uh, singing and dancing, I think is another one. So we offer a couple of different off like workshops. Um, but it's, yeah, so once, we, once they email us or message us, we email them an information pack. And if they're interested in the workshops that we offer, then they contact us back and say, you know, what dates have you got available? Or yes, we'd like to book you in. Um, and then from there, it's, you know, sending a quote and then booking a scene and going from there. Um, for the regular ones that we have, they just give me a call and, and call me up and say, hey, you know, we're keen to get you back in. Um, um, what date do you have available? Whether you, the, the workshops that they do, they, they're not really worried about what kind of workshop it is, just as long as it's, I'm able to provide that engagement and that act, just in any activity, cultural activity that the kids love, because, all the workshops that I do, they're all engaged in fun and hands-on. So the educators just want that that hands-on, fun, engaging activity. That's all they're really interested in. Um, the cultural stuff is just, a, it's an extra, it's a bonus for them to, to learn. So, um, and for, you know, something that I haven't been able, when I first started, there wasn't a lot of, uh, I didn't really um, have the experience working with kids. I was more working with young people through my uh, through my career it's really more teenagers and a little bit older that I, that I usually work with so to work with children like three to five and a little bit older it was really difficult for me at the start so luckily my fiance worked in childcare as well so she was able to provide me with some knowledge on how to interact and how to um, change and adapt the work that I'm doing to suit the age range um, and um, and you know really notice the attention span of the kids because that can that can change really quickly um so you know although our workshops go for you know we offer about an hour they could be could be less could be more depending on the engagement and the and the, and the um, attention span of the, of the kids that we work with but um but yeah it's it's more about the 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 new ones they they message us we send them what we offer then they come back to us with what what they would like and then for the regular ones they just message us and say come in we just we just love the work i'd say taylor a question i've got is do early childhood services know what they want or do they rely on you to actually go hey we want something cultural but we don't know where to start yeah yeah it's that second one it's that second one they they want that like they they uh, and I'll, I'll give you an example like today i was at a, I was at a preschool today um this morning and uh, it's, it was a new one, and um, in in Albury, and she she said that she wants to embed culture. She wants to do the work, and she wants to be able to provide this service for the kids. But she's not sure how to do it, where to go to, who to talk to, and not make it sound like I'm gonna like not make it sound so insensitive or, or, or um, inappropriate for a non-Aboriginal person to embed that culture. So, you know, how do we go about that? What kind of things can we do to make sure that we're not being inappropriate to the Aboriginal community and the local Aboriginal community as well? Um, so that when people come in, if they're Aboriginal, they're going to see that, you know, we're being authentic. And that's, you know, that's really what they want. They want to have that authenticity and they want to be able to say that we, uh, we welcome Aboriginal people um, and... Um, yeah, so, but yeah, it's, it's that second one. They, they want to do it, but they're just not sure how to do it. Yep. Quick question up on the screen there for Taylor is what areas do you visit your workshops and will you come to Melbourne? <laughs> I've, I've had a few, few people ask me to come to Melbourne. The only issue that I have is 
um, or not issue, but the barrier that I'm having is um, uh, I need to get that permission from, from local elders to be able to go to. So at the moment, um, I go to places where I'm able to speak to elders and the community and Kezos and the ACG, making sure that I'm following that cultural protocol. Um, and so there is, yeah, that question of cultural protocol around service. So I need to make sure that I get that permission from the elders. Um, not just, you know, it's, I think that's for me as well um, as a um, to follow and make sure that I'm doing the right thing. Um, so I go to, at the moment, Wangaratta, Wodonga, Albury. I'm going to Tamora in New South Wales. Excuse me, um, Wagga. Um, you know, I've, uh, but I haven't been to Melbourne yet to deliver any workshops. But, um, you know, that's something that I would like to do. Um, but whether or not I need to make sure that I speak to the right people to follow those cultural protocols to make sure that I can do that on the country that I'm not on. So, um, you know, one day I hope, but, um, but at the moment, uh, can't get there yet. Well, thank you. Um, Jenny, I'll come back and answer your question in a minute, but I want to throw it back over to Shay and go, what is it that you offer and that are from somewhere else and seek permission from their parents or work with their parents to develop them some basic stuff around, you know what's going on there? Uh, should I keep talking? Can you hear me? Let's keep talking. We can hear you. Okay. Uh, some basic stuff for them, Mob. So I've, I've developed a fair fair resource library over the years. Um, and then, yeah, yeah just um, methodically move through uh, the principles for us, Mob, and then to them, Mob. Uh, but again, same as like Taylor said, attention spans are, uh, are different. So the other thing I like to do is identify what they would probably term problem kids or kids that are a bit busy um, and make them my little helper for the day, which they uh, – they generally appreciate. So most of these kids with ADHD or any of those sorts of things, they are um, they just need something to do. I think once you find their interest, I think they're away. So they feel feel like they're pretty special when you give them, give them a gig for the day and, um, yeah, it works pretty well. Cool. Thanks. A um, bit of a question to Taylor first. Taylor, what are some things that early childhood uh, services can actually start can do to start implementing cultural uh, perspectives into curriculum. Yeah, um, look, I think one of the one of the main things is um, you know embedding it into your everyday routine. Um, and I don't know if you're doing it or not, but you know acknowledgement to countries is a big one. Um, doing that at the start of your start of your morning for you as soon as your kids rock up. Um, you know, doing the country, making it obviously personal to to the centre, to the area that you're on. If you know the area, make sure you acknowledge the area as well. Um, even even uh, as far as language as well, if you know the if you know the language, or if you know someone that has a bit of knowledge around language of that of your mob or the, the mob that you're on, the land that you're on, um, embedding that in the in the acknowledgement, uh, having um, different places in different areas of your room that has language areas, or this can be a, you know a language area or space that has a language um, name to it. Um, so just making you know, having different spaces where you can have cultural or just like, um, uh, I think, uh, placemats, um, little bean bags, really just something that they can just walk into, something tactile that they can play with as well. Um, you know, those resources where you get the mats, the tablecloths, um, even artwork um, on the walls um, that they can see, um, you know, get local artists to do something, do a painting for them um, that's sp specific to your, you know, to your centre that could be a great one. Um, you know, reaching out to local organisations. Um, I tell that to um, all the centres that I go to around uh, any specific questions. I say reach out to your local or Aboriginal organisation. Um, local elders um, is a great one. See if they can get a, a representative to come in and talk about what they do and, and how they can um, how they can help the centre um, to even just get a local perspective. Um, that's a great one. Um, even, you know, outside... Um, have a specific area, uh, a yarning circle area um, or a meeting place where they can sit down, have lunch, um, have totem poles or something where you can put together. Kids can, you know, they can join in on making it, making it spe special to them, um, personal to them as well. Um, you know, this is the one that I, you know, I, I, I asked my fiance tonight. She said that um, what she likes about it is that, you know, you're, you're reading the Dreamtime stories 
when you're talking about a specific topic or a, a something that you can talk to. So, um, you know, if you a topic is talking about uh, frogs, read Tidlick the Frog. If it's talking about snakes, Rainbow Serpent. If it's talking about um, talking about kangaroos, you know, how the kangaroo got its pouch, how the kangaroo got its um, tails or birds, you know, how the bird parrots, you know, how, um, yeah, how the parrot got its um, colours, so, or how the birds got their colours. So if there's anything specific that you're, you're learning in your centre, make it, have it, see if there's a, a dream time storybook that's, um, that you can add into on that as well. Um, music and dance, listening to music, um, you know, from Aboriginal artists, just playing in the background. Gurumul, he's a great one. Um, that's very soothing and calming that you can just listen to. He, he sings in language and um, you can just do that even during sleep time where it's just, it just uh, it's a beautiful thing. I'd like to play that every time we do our art programs or our workshops. Um, and even when you're making it, your, your, your centre feel welcome, um, having the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander flag is, is enough to know that they're, you're, you're feeling, that they're Aboriginal people feeling acknowledged. Uh, music and artwork or even just little placemats, um, clap sticks, something that you can just display um, is a great way as well. So there are a couple of little things that I, that I tell, the, um, tell, tell the educators how they can start by, um, you know, adding in that perspective and, and, and starting to embed that, that culture to make it seem like um, that you can, you know, allow the, the kids and their families, because as AJ said, you know, it's, you're, not, you're not just bringing the kid in, it's bringing the whole family in. So when they pick up the child, you know, they're feeling welcome. When they leave, they're feeling welcome. And, um, you know, even getting their perspective as well. How they, asking asking them, asking the, you know, the family, what what do you do in your home that we can um, help to help your child feel like they're, you know, they're, they're feeling culturally welcome. Yeah. Now, Taylor, question was, who was the musician, the music artist? Uh, Gurumul. Gurumul. Um, I'll just double check how to spell his name, but... While you do that, I'm going to throw over to Shay. Shay, we do have a question that came up, which was, uh, how do we reach out respectfully with local organisations? Is there a best way to communicate that we would like to be in partnership with them somehow? Well, in most cases, there's, um, as you mentioned there before, the Kessos, and there's the, what do you call the early childhood mob as well that get around. Um, so that's probably a first port of call. Um, but I think just the... It's time now for this sort of stuff to take place. So I think the organisation is pretty happy when they get a get a request or um or ask to come down and do something with the mob. So yeah, I think you'll be fine. Just trust yourself. Yep. Um, Shay, question. Um, what what strategies or techniques do you recommend early childhood services start to do to embed culture? expand on what Taylor was saying. Yep. I think um, for me, like I said earlier, it was about uh, identifying what they already do, but it's it's kind of easy for us in a way too. It's, I call it the numbers game. So there's one nation, there's 59 clans, there's five languages, there's four types of country, there's six seasons, and you, there's your curriculum right there. So during those three seasons of the year, uh, sorry, the two seasons, uh, two months of each season, there's something going on, so they've, they've planted some 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 uh, trees and, and plants out the back that'll be flowering at certain times, or whether they're used for the basket grass or whatnot. Uh, during the summer, try and get them out to come on come out on country down to the coast, and there's lots of things you can eat there. There, and so my daughter, she's four, and she can she'll tell people not that one, this one over here, that sort of thing. Um, but it's already there. The basis. It just depends on whether um, where the place is, is as open as we are down here to include people in what we already do and then try and identify outside of that and, and showcase that person. So we've got um, a lot of Stradbroke Island mob down here. We've got some Noongars. Um, so respectfully asking their mob back to their country to, to send some resources through so we can highlight the fact that we do have this, this rich diversity of Aboriginal people living on, on good Jamara country. And it, uh, it's hard for some of the mobs that, to learn other people's stuff, they're, they're very. Um, what would you say? They don't. They don't want to at the start, but when they see how inclusive it is and what we're trying to achieve, they're okay. So, at the kin at the kinder, uh, when my daughter goes now in the November or the December before the next year, they invite me to come down to a welcome to country for all the new students that have become and all the new kids coming the next year, um, and I give them a short uh, cultural awareness session about. Um, what's happened, you know, nothing too severe. Obviously, it's only kinder, but um, once the parents sort of understand a little bit more about what's happened to us, that, yeah, that um, empathy and uh, understanding, as per that video, AJ, is, um, is, is really important. 
and repetition is the other one. So the book that we created recently, and I did head, shoulders, knees and toes in language. I wrote a lullaby in language um, and did one other one. I can't quite think of what it was what now. But in the class, I recorded it singing it because everyone else didn't know the language or the words. So I recorded it singing it with all the kids there and then I sent that to all the parents. So in two weeks it took before all of them could say it. And they're tongue twisters too. So uh, they were obviously giving it a go. Uh, and that, yeah, that, that repetition was well, recorded. Um, they don't have to have, have a go of it in front of everybody else. So that shame thing's still a factor for a lot of mob too. So you just got to, yeah, pick your audience, pick the ones who are going to be good on the day and, and just slowly bring the other ones into it. I'm going to throw open to questions. I'm just going to just check if any questions I've actually missed up here. Um, we, one thing that we have brought up in a couple of other workshops as well is that there are men, there are, I think Di put out to everyone else, but she's like, just checking whether it was to everybody or just to me, um, that there is a great language kit in Woiwurrung language as well that Mandy Nicholson has, has written for Woiwurrung, for Rundry land. Um, that doesn't mean that if you should be automatically using it in other lands as well. And my last conversation with Mandy as well is was that there's been some organisations where or some um, schools and some early childhood services that have been just using the book and mispronouncing words and not actually using it correctly without actually speaking to local language uh, advisors to actually go, how do we actually pronounce some of this stuff? Because it's not read exactly phonetically as it's actually, sorry, it's not spoken as phonetically as it's written as well. So to, to please, um, if you are using some of those resources that you might actually want local people just to explain to you exactly the right pronunciation of what you're actually doing. Um, so I'm going to throw open to the audience group that is right here tonight. Any questions you've got for Shay or Taylor or both? You must have some questions. I have a question. Yeah, sure. What's your question? Hi, um, my name's Jackie. <laughs> um, I, thought I, Galaxy Tab. I thought your name was Galaxy Tab. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm working now, I worked in Fitzroy last year and most of the children spoke English as a first language and their parents were really comfortable like talking about things at home like um, these children were, like, familiar with the phrase, like, sovereignty was never ceded. You know, these four-year-olds are, like, comfortable with it. But now I work in Hume and Craigieburn and the children are really, like, culturally diverse and there's a lot of um, language barriers and I've just been wondering about, like, um, I guess kind of including a bit of, like, acknowledgement of... Um, the Wurundjeri culture and things like that alongside these children's home culture because I think sometimes I get, you know, confused looks from the children and they kind of don't really know um, this, this other thing that I'm talking about. Sometimes it can be quite hard and I kind of wanted it to contextualise it with their cultures as well and I just kind of sure if that's, like, respectful to be, like, you know, um, I guess position it alongside their cultures kind of how to present um, Indigenous culture alongside other cultures. Shay Taylor, either of you? That's a tough one. Um, uh, yeah, look, I, I think, I mean, I, I can't I can't speak on behalf of the, the Rundry mob because I'm not Rundry, but um, I think in terms of the, you know, the, the young people that you're working with, the kids that you're working with, I think um, I, I would try, um, I mean, I don't want to put too many, you know, things in, in, their, in their heads um, and, uh, you know, they, they may have a, a different way of, of seeing what culture is to them compared to what the other kids that you were working with previously um and so they you know they could have been brought up 
in a different way or in a different light. You know, they might not see that, you know, see the those different terms or those words that you heard previously. Um, so that's probably why they're getting a bit confused as to um, what those uh, statements mean. Um, so um, I think, you know, from, from the perspective of those kids, I think, you know, trying to figure out how... Um, what their culture means to them rather than trying to put that into, you know, the, the other culture, what you, the ones of people that you work with before into, into the work that you do now with these kids, finding out what they, what they do to practice culture at home, finding out, um, you know, what their family do, um, what they do in their community. Um, and then using that as a way to uh, build that relationship and rapport with those kids. I think that's probably the way that I would, um, I would go about it. Um, I'm not sure about Shay, but um, I'll throw over to Shay now. Shay, yeah, yeah. I'd probably try and look for um, something the similarities between the cultures. So, for most most cultures have got things that we share in common. Um, a lot of regards. Uh, it was like two days ago. I had to do a um, an online thing for uh, some pastoral care people, and I thought they meant pastoral as in agriculture but it was actually um six people who were becoming priestesses um so i talked about how we have uh, we have a heaven and a hell and uh, we have a god we have this place that we go to we have um all these things that were very similar and that's why our people like down this way didn't mind well not didn't mind but were able to, to swallow the christianity when it came uh, i think the other thing is you've got to remember that um like at that at that um, younger age group we're just setting them up to build up the knowledge base. Um, so I'll just be using key words, Wiradjuri, uh, Wiradjuri, you know, the bits and pieces that they, they'll remember because um, education is always put in the same context as, as traditional life. It's, it's a rites of passage. You only get that extra bit of knowledge when you've learned the other stuff first. So to start out small, um, once, once they seem to have retained the bits and pieces that you're trying to um, embed with them, then you can move on to something a little bit more, a uh, little bit more, um, a bit harder to understand, I guess, but at that age, then you know it's all sensory and and going from one thing to the next, so they don't lose their uh, lose their attention. Thank you. Yeah, I have been quite. I like to be honest with the children, but being quite nervous to mention the concept of um, stolen land and try to explain that to children. A lot of them um, whom are refugees, and that's yeah, that's a challenge. I wasn't really prepared for when I explain that I think it would definitely be mis probably misconstrued by some of the children um trying to explain because a lot of them have just come from other lands to Australia so I think um focusing on similarities first especially in the context of uh, refugee children would be really helpful thank you thank you um galaxy I forgot your name again but galaxy tab s2 um any other questions you've got Now's your chance to ask. Oops, I do have a question. It's come through to me privately. It says, uh, can you can these guys, I presume you mean that Shay and Taylor, come onto land that's not theirs without permission? And do we need to get the permission? I think the issue is, and I'll answer this first, is that um, if you do invite them, they actually are Aboriginal consultants so you and, and Aboriginal run their own businesses. Part of their cultural protocol would be to, to get that uh, approval from the elders of that particular land. Shay's nodding in agreement and Taylor's nodding in agreement as well. So they would be able, they would be able to do that, no problem. Um, any other questions on the email, on the on the chat? Got a couple uh, private to me. Uh, both of them, Taylor and, and Shay, you've done really well. Thank you for sharing that. That's what's coming through to me. Um, oh, do we need to always consult with Aboriginal elders? I'll, I'll throw over to Shay and and and. Taylor in one second to answer this for, for, for where they are. What I do know from, I work here in on the Bunurong and Runjuri areas and the local elders are actually going, we're exhausted. We don't need to be consulted on every single thing. Please stop 
all of a sudden the reconciliation action plans are actually going, you need to talk to elders, you need to talk to elders. And our elders down here are actually going, sorry, we don't need to talk to every single childcare service around. There are consultants and people that are admired in community and consultants that actually have rec recognition from the traditional owners to actually speak um, and work on land. And I think it's really important to understand too, and I've said this in other workshops that we've done, is that if you are seeking support from, and if you think that you need to seek, seek support from elders of the community, think about what you're actually asking. Are you asking for an endorsement to do something? Are you asking permission to do something? Are you asking for advice or support? Or do you need their, um, do you need to learn something from them? Because that consultation is very, very different, if that makes sense. And the elders are actually saying, we don't have time to go to every single uh, early childhood centre around our particular areas to provide this support and information. Reconciliation Victoria um, has now got a point of call that, I um, can't remember her name, Jo, who actually screens some of the information that you can actually send. Look, we're, we're thinking of embedding this. What's your idea? So they can give some support, but they're actually also going back to Reconciliation Australia under the Nungal, Narragal Wally um, structure to actually say, please do not just say, um, go and contact elders because elders are, are stretched. They are tired, they are exhausted. And part of this stuff can be done by other people who have been endorsed and supported by traditional owners. Ashay or Taylor, do you want to add anything to that for where you are? Yeah, I'll just jump in real quickly. I think a lot of people get confused between having to ask elders for stuff when they're actually just looking for the authority to start what they're doing. And the authority can come from, as you just said, AJ, from from the organisations, um, from service providers. Um, yeah, it depends what you're after. Um, having an elder in a room brings a presence, brings that past into that room. That's a that's a big thing for, for young people to sort of understand. But, yeah, that thing about tiring them out, they're um, – our elders are few and far between and the ones who have connections back to missions and things like that are even less so. So we try and protect them as much as possible. And they've done their work. They've, they've, they've built the organisations. They've put the 10 embassy up. They've done all that sort of stuff. And then they've opened the door for us to walk through it. Um, and I think it's important that, um, yeah, we give them that time to rest and put them up on their pedestal, fluff their pillows and ask them if they want to drink a water or whatever it is and, and give them, give them the, the, the golden years to them what they should have. You know, they've done the hard stuff. So... Yeah, sometimes it's um sometimes you put children or anybody in front of an elder, they love that chat. So if you get the right one, no dramas, they'll talk all day. But um yeah, there's a lot of tired bodies out there, that's for sure. Taylor, anything you want to add from where you are where you're based? Yeah, no, look, look, I'm on the same. Um it's you know, we you know, I've got permission from from elders in my community to 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 perform the, the workshops that I do. So um, you know, if it's I, I think when, you know, it's if they want to guest speaker or if they, you know, even like if they want to perform a, a, or hold a, um, you know, a ceremony or something, you know, where they, where they need to, you know, where they would like a, a welcome to the country, you know, maybe the time. But, you know, when it, when it comes to, um, you know, as, as Shay said, you know, that, that authority or, you know, anything to make sure that you, you're performing or doing something culturally appropriate, um, you do have other significant people in the community that are able to answer that Um that that have you know already consulted with elders and, and already doing the work um, that that you're wanting to do anyway. So um, yeah, I yeah I'm, yeah I agree um, with both of you guys. Yeah. Yep. So I think a tip would be that um, if before you engage with a particular consultant, actually do a bit of research and ask them those questions. Like, do you mm -hmm. have traditional owner support, and can they be able to demonstrate that? Um, not, and I'm not saying this is the, the the way to do it, but I know that on my website, I've got Annie Dye, the Rundry Elder, supporting my work, and she says it clearly on there. Um, the Boonarong uh, Lands Council have got a representative that say we support AJ doing that work. And anytime I write proposals and it's on Rundry or Boonarong land, I refer to those particular uh, YouTube, or sorry, those particular uh, videos. So you can actually say, organizations can see that the support is actually already kind of there 
So it's about doing the research about who's the most appropriate person. And if they don't, that's a question you can ask about how will you get that support? And if they don't know how to do that, that's a, one of the first issues. That's a first red flag to actually go, well, if they're saying that they can do this and they don't have that endorsement or support, then that would be a bit of a, a barrier. Um, is it a problem that the Nungara Wally rap process is organising a welcome to country as a required action? I can't expect to afford this unless it's a special event. Well, this is where I'm going to say something first. This is where you can be quite creative. Why don't you think about asking one of the elders to actually maybe record a welcome to country that you can actually use and you pay that elder to do that recording with permission that you use it for a certain period of time. They record it, they, you've paid them as a one-off, but then you can use that for a period of maybe two, two or three years. And then after that, that agreement ceases, which means you wouldn't need to necessarily pay the, because we do know that you, you, you know, a lot of services wouldn't be able to pay uh, for a welcome to country all the time, but that's just one way of looking outside the box. Shay, Taylor, anything else you could think of to answer that particular question? Yeah, the um, the whole acknowledgement thing is sort of half newish, I guess. Um, so for, for me personally, there's a, if there's a, if there's a, a wage that goes with it or a payment to be made, I'll sort of go and ask people who I know might need that. Um, I do a lot of that stuff for free. Oh, I think it's a it's an honour to be able to welcome people to country. Or do any, I don't necessarily do acknowledgements because it is my country that welcoming people to. So do the Australian citizenship um, ceremonies and things like that down here. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one because if you overdo it, it does become tokenistic, I believe. So it's got to be sort of um, yeah tailored for the for the for the for the event. If it's something hard like a rap rap um, launch or you know. Uh, an opening of a new centre, something big. Yeah, the elders love that sort of stuff. I actually did a flag raising today at the Narrowong Primary School. They got their new Torres Strait Islander flag and couldn't get anybody. They tried to get an elder who was my dad's older sister and she wasn't able to get back to him, but she had a change of phones in between. So I took my Torres Strait spear, Torres Strait drum and a big turtle shell I've got from Cairns and explained the bits and pieces I know about the Torres Strait mob. And then right at the end, my auntie turns up. So I ended up just holding the umbrella for her in the rain, uh, you know, while she... Took the took the glory of raising the flag, but um, I felt very proud to hold that umbrella over her. So I think there's, um, yeah, again, it's horses for courses, and the community you're in, we're all at different places. So it's all new ground for us, all of it, and it's very sensitive. But um, trust your instincts, I guess. That's what I'm saying. Uh, Taylor, I've got a question here, and I've got something to say before, but I'll throw it straight over to you. Can you imagine a time when early childhood services have the Uluru Statement of the Heart on display? like New Zealand early childhood settings have a Treaty of Waitangi. I just want uh, to make an announcement before I throw over to you that not all Aboriginal people support the um, the Uluru Statement of the Heart. And to check with the the either the traditional owners or uh, families whether or not that would be offensive before putting it up. Taylor. Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I, I in, in the last few years since I've done this business, I haven't seen any uh, the statement at all. Um, hanging up, and that uh, could be for for any other reason. But um, I, I would just I would uh, um, say that one of the main reasons is because that the um, the centres um, haven't been um, you know learning a lot of our culture, and that goes to the the question at the top from Nicole, where it's asking um, about their own personal journey of their uh, understanding Aboriginal ways. I don't think the 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 centres um, have enough knowledge. On what that means and 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 what kind of stuff that they could do to you know to start their own cultural journey in terms of the centre's cultural journey um, and um, I think there's just not enough education to uh, to to display a lot of those kind of um, political statements um, to make sure that you know we all want to be um, inclusive and I think that as AJ said not a, not a lot of people not lot, not everyone uh, in terms of Aboriginal people agree with the Uluru statement um, but I think it's just about yeah I, I, I haven't seen it in the in the centres that I've worked in um, but again it's I think that's also about the lack of education and the um, around the knowledge and not not on their fault but it's just that they haven't felt 
comfortable enough to to seek it out, I think, because they didn't want to make it uh, be um, culturally inappropriate. Can Sorry. I just add something to that real quick? Yeah, um, we had a similar question not long ago, and what we decided to do was add the UN Conventions for, ch for Children instead and put that up there. Um, so there's a whole whole list of things around around ch children uh, that's pertinent to everybody, black, white or brindle. So I think that um, all the restatements kind of different in that regard. But, uh, yeah, I think that UN Conventions for Children is uh, much more pertinent in, the, in this space. Um, before we do go, because it's getting time, any final questions for either Taylor or Shay? Going once, going twice. Okay, Shay, any final comments? I think I've said it a couple of times, just trust your instincts. Uh, if you're unsure, ask, and um, good luck. Cool. Taylor? Uh, yeah, look, um, yeah, I agree with Shay, absolutely. Um, I think the one of the biggest things that, um, that I talk about, um, not just in this business that I do, but, you know, my work, my day-to-day -day job as well, is don't just assume that all Aboriginal people know Aboriginal history or, or a lot of the stuff. Um, don't just assume that we all practice the same um, cultural traditions um, and the best ways to know that is just to ask ask the question um, how they like to be identified what kind of stuff they'd like to do in their own family with their family traditions if they do and how you can embed there and you know incorporate that into into your work practice as well I think that's yeah, the biggest one as well thanks guys um, just to let you all know this is this is the 10th of the 12th uh, series. All the um, previous recordings of the previous nine are all up on the AJEX, the Ast Association of Graduates in Early Childhood Studies uh, website under the Reconciliation page. Uh, next month, we've got uh, the wonderful Kerry Arabina coming in to actually talk to us about the first 1,000 days and embedding Torres Strait Islander perspectives into curriculum which will be very interesting. Um, as always, um, I've really enjoyed uh, the conversations both Taylor and Shay were able to actually um, bring to us tonight. I can see, guys, you probably can see the feedback coming through going, thank you, thank you very much for what, uh, what you've actually done and always great food for thought. Um, these workshops are designed to start conversations they are not about actually um, always providing all the answers, but they're actually providing more questions than answers, which is actually great. Um, I just want to say thank you to Ajax again for putting this workshop on. And um, I will actually throw out, because throw out this out to people. Um, I wasn't going to, but I will at the end. Um, I've been really lucky this last a week. I, for people that do know me, I moderate the, the these sessions. I've just been awarded the um, Swinburne uh, Alumni Impact Award for uh, Swinburne University. And this week on Thursday night, if you tune into the Victoria University Alumni, apparently I'm up for award in there as well. Um, Victoria University goes, they're not sure if ever anyone's been nominated for two different universities in the same year, but um, I'm really quite honoured to be able to um, do workshops like this and to be able to show some sort of social impact of what we actually do and what I actually do. Uh, everything I do is for community, everything I do is for my family and for my, um, my children and my grandchildren so they can look back and actually go, yep, my dad and my granddad actually did this. So, guys, I want to say, can we please give a good round of applause? Take your microphones off. Take your mute off. So we want to hear it. We want to hear some claps for... Thanks, guys. So thanks, guys. Join us next month and have a wonderful night. Good night, guys. Thank you. Thank you.